One young man following behind was clothed only in, only in a long linen shirt when the mob tried to grab him. He slipped out of his shirt and ran away naked. That is one of the stranger passages in Mark. No idea what it means, but let's see what we can figure out in the book of Mark. Welcome, I'm so excited that you joined in. Before we're going to start, I just want to give you a quick overview of this lesson or of this lecture. So I'm going to start with a historical background. Then I'm going to look on how does Mark portray Jesus in the gospel. Then I'm going to focus on two different audiences, the original reader and the original hearer. And then at the end, I want to focus on one specific passage in the first chapter, which totally unlocked the book for me. So let's start with the historical background. So when we read the Bible, something really important to look at is the historical background. The book of Mark wasn't written in the same time of Jesus. It was written 30 years after. So it was written in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire took over after the Greek Empire. The Roman Empire was a brutal empire. They taxed people horrendous amounts because they believed that conquerors deserved to be paid. The cross was a symbol of human torture. It was safe for the worst of sinners, especially slaves or the lowest type of criminals. The way of keeping the power was by killing everyone who stood in the way. The Jews saw the Romans as the oppressor of God's people. They expected that Christ would come and defeat them. And so often in Mark, we see the confusion, confusion with the Jews because they accepted, sorry, they expected Jesus to be a conqueror king and to free them from their oppression. But Jesus came as a servant. So the head over the empire was a Caesar. He was viewed and worshiped the same as they would worship God. In the book of Mark, Nero was the Caesar. He was reigning from 64 to 68 AD. Nero did some berserk things. For example, he went out in disguise and robbed people, and then he set up markets in his temple, sorry, in his palace to sell the goods. He went around and stabbed people in the back. And after he had killed all his wives, he married a 12-year-old boy and he clothed him as a queen and he treated him as a queen. In 64 AD, he wanted to gain more territory. So he burned down 10 out of 14 districts of Rome and he blamed it on the Christians. And so that started a huge persecution. Nero's persecution was one of the worst in history. He dipped Christians into oil and then lit them on fire and used them as torches for his private garden parties. He would sow Christians in animal skin and put them in an arena with wild beasts where they got torn into pieces just for their amusement. And Mark is the gospel written for the persecuted Christian under the reign of Nero. And so that is so important to keep this in the mind when you're reading the book. And when you have the historical background in mind, you can see how brilliantly Mark crafted the book together. It was to encourage, to challenge, and to comfort those who are suffering. That means when you go to interpret, you need to ask the questions and looking at the text from their point of views. Just like Jordan said in the first video, take off our shoes and put on their shoes or their sandals. So let's look at who Jesus is in the book of Mark. Let me read Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It says, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as ransom for many. 
So there's an emphasis on Jesus being the promised Messiah who will suffer. Mark showed special interest in persecution. We can see that in chapter 6, in chapter 8, in chapter 9, in chapter 13, and so on. Because this topic was very real for the original readers. Another thing that we can observe is the word immediately. It is repeated 59 times in the New Testament and 41 times in Mark. And the word and, it's repeated 1,379 times in the book of Mark. And that leads me to the point that this book is so fast paced. It is written under pressure. It says, and this happened, and this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Unlike Matthew, Mark's main focus was not to prove certain statements or prophecies concerning Jesus, but Mark shows Jesus as a servant. How does Mark portray it? So the book of Mark was written to the Romans. There's no genealogy because Romans weren't so concerned about the Old Testament, unlike the Jews. So they were not interested in prophecies being fulfilled, but they wanted to hear more about the remarkable leader in Palestine who was called Jesus. What sort of person he was, not so much what he said, but more about what he did. Because Romans cared little for words, but more for deeds. And we can see that again in the book. Mark has only four parables, but 20 miracles. The reason why Mark wrote the book was to tell certain facts about Jesus. He wanted the original reader to understand that Jesus came as a suffering servant and not as a conquering king. Even though Jesus was the Messiah and he was the Son of God, he took on flesh to redeem us from our sin and from death. And Mark wanted to encourage the persecuted church to endure the suffering and to tell them that suffering is a normal part of Christianity. They are called to suffer. Now I want to focus on two different audiences, the original hearer and the original reader. So let's start with the original reader. So the gospel didn't get written immediately after Jesus's ministry. Mark wrote the book to a specific audience 30 years later. So he knew that the recipient of this letter is suffering under the persecution of Nero. And he knew that this letter will actually comfort them and it will encourage them. And so I really encourage you, when you're reading through Mark, to just stop and read through a passage and then keep those people in your mind and think about what would have meant to them, to those people who were in persecution. The next audience is the original hearer. So the audience during Jesus's ministry. So for example, the Pharisees in the temple when Jesus was speaking or when Jesus was performing a huge miracle and he was feeding the 5,000. Think about a little boy who just sit there. What was he thinking? How would he have felt? We don't always know it exactly, but the more we study, we will come closer. Now I want to focus on one passage in Mark, it's in chapter one, which unlocked the book for me. It totally changed it. It is in Mark chapter one, verse nine to 11. One day Jesus came and John baptized him in the river. As Jesus came out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice from heaven said, you are my dearly son and you bring me great joy. So I want to focus, or I want to start with observation because that is the first step. And
And in that, I'm going to look at an event, which is the baptism of Jesus. And then I want to look at the pronoun you. And then he describes, you bring me great joy. So now we looked at observation. The next step is interpretation. I asked those two questions, or I'm starting with the first one actually. Why do we have the baptism but not the birth in Mark? So unlike Matthew's gospel, Mark didn't focus on Jesus' fulfilling prophecies, but Mark focused on what Jesus did. And before Jesus did anything, he already had the approval of his father. Which leads me to the next question, why is Jesus being called his son who brings him great joy? He was called like that even though he hasn't done any miracles or any healings or any teachings. There's no reason for the father to call Jesus his son who brings him great joy. But in my opinion, this paragraph in the first chapter is the foundation of his ministry. Remember the big picture. Jesus came to suffer. So in the whole book, we can see that Jesus is rejected. He is denied. And at the end, he is crucified. And so Jesus knew that he is going to suffer. But for that, Jesus needed to be known by his father so that he was able to suffer. He needed to know his true identity. And he needed to know that the father loved him before he did anything. The father loved Jesus because of who he was and not of what he did. Now we have looked at interpretation. We can now go to the last step, which is application. So what can I take out as a timeless truth of this passage? The father loves people before they are born. He didn't love me anymore when I became a Christian. Or the father didn't love me anymore when I started to do a Bible school a couple of years ago. Or even now when I'm teaching the Bible. God has always loved me. And it's not about my good works that I can earn God's love. In fact, you cannot do anything to earn God's love because it is a free gift of grace. My other timeless truth is, people need to know their true identity in God. We need to know that we are known by the Father so that we can love people even if they reject us. And so, just by going through observation, interpretation and application, we can see how the passage is actually coming alive. And so I really encourage you to take a passage, a chapter, or yeah, just even a verse, to take time and use those three steps. It will really unlock the text. I'm really excited for Sunday when we have the Zoom. I hope I can see you guys there. And I'm really excited to hear your guys' questions or your revelations or anything that you have figured out in the book of Mark. Now, let me just pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you gave us the book of Mark so that we can learn more about you. And I just really pray for everyone who's yeah, listening to this right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will speak to them and that you will speak to their hearts. I thank you for who you are and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for taking time and hopefully see you on Sunday. Bye.